truly good businesses are the ones who can fend off competitors, who can really have enduring competitive advantage and cap that higher than average return on invested capital, and hopefully also have a long runway of continuous growth. Okay, um, so in this concentration, in sort of now investing in great businesses, um, can you be specific about what kind of business you look for? What are the characteristics of a great business in particular? What detailed characteristics you look for, and how you put a value on those businesses? Yeah, well, uh, great businesses are the ones who really have above average returns to invest the capital. <clears throat> But that kind of businesses usually attract imitators, competitors. Everybody wants to have above average return to reinvest the capital. And so truly good businesses are the ones who can fend off competitors, who can really have enduring competitive advantage and cap that higher than average return on invested capital, and hopefully also have a long runway of continuous growth those are the businesses we're looking for. And they could really come in all industries, in all shapes and forms. Um, but they're rare. They're really, really rare. Um, to have a business that generate above average returns over a long time on a compounded fashion is, again, is really against the natural orders of things. Um, it really only a small slice of all businesses belong to that category. So if you're really lucky enough to really find one of those long-term compounders, all you have to do is really uh, to, <laughs> to own them and own them for the longest period of time. Now, it helps when you really buy them at the time when they happen to be treated <clears throat> at a discount to their intrinsic value. So that if you were wrong about them, <clears throat> you won't lose money. And if you're right, you have more returns over time. But over the longest period of time, if you do own them through the up and downs, um, your return roughly approximates basically the actual business return to the actual capital you invested in the business itself over the long term. The two tend to really converge pretty closely. And so understanding and study the nature of that business, the dynamic of competition is of really the most important thing as the investor and as a student of the business. And as I said, the, there, there isn't really a set of things uh, that really make them that way. Every business really builds their fortress um, slightly differently. And you just have to really truly be honest with yourself and study from every possible angles until you're really convinced that the edge that they're currently enjoying, uh, in, uh, enjoying truly are enduring, and they truly have a long runway ahead of them. And if uh, they prove to be exactly as you predicted over the years, we really want to really stay on them through the up and down thick and thin, not to be really this way uh, easily. Okay, can I actually uh, talk a little bit about um, those businesses? I mean, in limiting competition, and I think Charlie Munger is the master at this, you're really interested in moats. That is the barriers to entry into the business because it's keeping people out that's gonna limit competition. Yep. If you think about a moat, there are probably two elements to that moat. So think of it from the point of view of a company trying to get into the business. One is economies of scale. How big do you have to get? How big a market share do you have to capture in order to be viable as a competitor? So in automobiles, in the global automobile market, it's really large. And if you get one to two percent share, you're going to be fine. In other markets, like, for example, local distribution of caffeinated soft drinks, you got to get to 20 to 25 percent of the market to support uh, the infrastructure that you need uh, and to compete. So the first thing is economies of scale. And the second thing I think, and again, I'm sort of thinking about Charlie Munger here, is how hard is it to get that market share, which is all about customer captivity in a 
contested environment where unique technology will help you with that and so on. So suppose you got to get to 25% share. We know for caffeinated soft drinks that two tenths of a percent share changes hands every year in a contested market. So to get to 25%, you're talking about 125 year moat. Do you do a calculation like that for the companies you're looking at? You look at those two elements explicitly? Well, that and more. Okay. <laughs> so, then what's the more? <laughs> no, the scale is important. Uh, in there, actually, there is a scale economy in those businesses. Uh, not everything actually has a scale economy. And so sometimes that the scale becomes a, a counterpoint, <clears throat> make it actually more difficult to really manage. Um, but in a scale economy, uh, that uh, the scale does really <clears throat> become a competitive advantage. Um, and then, but, but the dynamic would change after a certain scale. You mentioned automobile, that's an interesting example. You know what happens in yeah. different phases of the industry. Um, the um, the 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 uh, consumer uh, side is also important in a sense that if you have um, quite a bit of um, uh, uh, consumer addiction <laughs> to a certain products and brand loyalty, obviously that is important, uh, and they're good for a long time until they're not good. Um, things do change. Uh, new product categories would have come along <clears throat> and brand get tired and old and not refreshed. New, new generations really don't like to have the same taste as their parents and grandparents. So that's really the most interesting aspect of businesses is, is <clears throat> what is only constant is the constant change. All great business changes over time. And Perhaps really no business who can really remain that competitive edge for forever. But some of the business really can keep it for a very, very, very long time. And of course, when it changes, it's really upon the management team to be able to really reallocate capital towards those businesses actually now enjoying a robust competitive advantage. I take an example with Berkshire. You know, started out as a lousy businesses, losing businesses <laughs> of textile in New England. <laughs> and Warren and Charlie skillfully really took the last bit of the cash flow and skillfully invested in some other businesses really on the right side of the trajectory. But over time, some of those businesses began to lose its competitive advantage. And then they took that capital and allocated to the ones that. So obviously <clears throat> the management and capability of allocating capital also plays a very important role. <clears throat> and of course that the uh, culture of a, uh, a company <clears throat> in the industry that's rapidly changing <clears throat> so that you always a few steps ahead of your competitors which allows you to always a surfing on the edge, that also <clears throat> becomes uh, enduring competitive advantage if that culture endures. So in every specific businesses, <clears throat> what really make them successful are very, very different. And they change over time. And so that is the most fascinating aspect of, of, of the competitive dynamics. And also the most fascinating aspect of being an investor. Is well, how do you, today, as of today, uh, Lulu, how do you do this differently, would you say, from most other investors? Are there things that you look at specifically? Are there ways that you approach companies? Now, I'll tell you the thing that when I started investing with you, and I'm honored to say that I made a lot of money doing it, that appealed to me was what you mentioned in your introduction, which is small. That small businesses are, or small markets are necessarily markets where you have to get a big share uh, because one firm can dominate. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that most investors look at. So in what other ways do you do things differently from most other value investors and investors? 
Yeah. Well, you're right. Uh, when you invested with me, or you began to invest with me. Thank God you're still with me. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for your continuing trust and confidence. Uh, no, back then we were looking for a smaller business because those are the business I feel I can understand them. And as we evolve, we began to look for bigger businesses that we can also understand. A bigger business does come with a whole set of advantages that if they are right, in a sense, um, they also come in with a whole bunch of problems. And so we're not really looking just big or medium or small. Size is, is one consideration, but it's not the most important. Uh, certainly not the determining factors when we're looking for businesses.